We're very glad to welcome Dr. Marius Wernick. Uh, he is a physician and PhD at Stanford University School of Medicine in California. He'll be talking about microglial engineering to combat Alzheimer's disease. So thank you so much for giving me this uh, opportunity to, um, to speak to you, and of course, for this amazing uh, support. As my uh, you know, colleagues have mentioned, these type of awards really mean so much to us. Uh, because those are little seeds in like new types of research that we are uh, planning to go, which we would never be able to do uh, from like sources like the NIH. They, they really want very uh, a lot of uh, preliminary data uh, to support the claims. So to really get to something new, it takes you know, people like you. So thank you so much for this. I will talk a little bit more about the cell type um, that uh, was already mentioned before, they are called microglia. And we um, have made some really exciting uh, progress to manipulate these cells in the brain. And we think this is a really nice uh, um, sort of new potential to, to use the system to hopefully combat Alzheimer's disease. So by way of background, uh, I'm a, a clinician scientist uh, working at Stanford my, in my clinical life. I've actually trained as a neuropathologist. So actually I've seen a lot of um, brains um, in autopsy that were unfortunately affected with the, with the disease. So clinically I know of the disease um, quite a lot. Uh, in my uh, sort of, um, as a, my, my science life, I'm a stem cell biologist. So we try to use uh, stem cells to find new cures and understand human diseases better. And we are located in this uh, beautiful building here, um, the Stem Cell Institute at Stanford. Um, I always like to start with this picture because it always reminds me um, how important it is to um, stay visionary. And in particular, uh, this painting fascinates me because as you can see down there, I put the, the lifespan of the painter here. Uh, this is about 500 years ago uh, when people had already this dream that it ought to be possible to enable rejuvenation. <laughs> um, I guess at that time there was not really much known about the biology of aging and things like you know, all the molecular tests that we know about. Um, and with the knowledge now, I think many scientists would agree with me that aging is actually a, um, a process that in theory should be reversible. Not, er not every aspect, but maybe some aspects. So um, it's amazing um, to see that people have had this, this vision already early on and we always have to keep our visions. Unfortunately, of course, we are still not, not quite there yet. We haven't found this amazing water. However, what we have found, and actually this was already mentioned by, my previous, uh, by the previous speaker, is that we can re rejuvenate not entire organisms, but we can rejuvenate cells. So about 20 years ago, many of you will probably remember Dolly the sheep. Dolly the sheep was, as we, as we called it back then, was cloned from an adult cell. So uh, the scientists here, centered around Ian Wilmot in, in Scotland, they managed to what we call reprogram an adult cell all the way back to a very, very, very early cell that is essentially like the fertilized egg, which is the beginning of life. And that created you know, a new animal, in this case it was Dolly. So that told us that at least in the lab, we can turn back the clock of aging, so to say, and turn, turn a cell into a, into a you know, newborn life. So this was done with um, transferring this adult cell into, a, into an egg. So we, from a mechanistic point of view, we didn't really know what was going on. We just knew that it's possible to do it, but not really how the cells are actually doing it. Um, and then comes uh, this Japanese scientist, Shinya Yamanaka, you see his name here, and this famous article that he published about 10 years ago, which was also, also just mentioned before, well, he found that this rejuvenation process, so to say, 
uh, can be induced by just four factors, which are listed here, OCT4, SOX2, CMYK, and KLO4. When you just add these four factors to an adult cell, it will do the trick and convert these, these skin cells, for example, or blood cells, or, or whatever adult cell you would take, and sort of turn them into these iPS cells, or it's an acronym for induced pluripotent stem cells, because these stem cells resemble the earliest stem cells that we know of, of the earliest embryo. So these cells actually can make all the tissues and cell types that make up our body. R a really remarkable process. So in my lab, actually, we, we were working on these, these IPSs, you know, right at the time when Shinya Yamanaka was um, discovering them. But we also uh, thought maybe we can extend this, this idea of uh, converting one cell type into another. Um, and since we are really interested in the brain, and in particular the, the, the neurons, we really liked this um, famous dictum by Richard Feynman, who said, what I cannot create, I do not understand. So we thought if we try to create neurons from scratch, so to say, you probably will learn a lot about these processes. And what we found is that we can actually take fibroblasts, which are like skin cells, and add another set of factors, which are these here, ACL1, brain 2, and mid one like are the names, to actually um, accomplish something very similar that Shinya Yamanaka had shown for these iPS cells, that we can now take skin cells and convert them directly into these cells that we call induced neuronal cells or IN cells, which very much look like neurons and behave like, like neurons. So we are really excited about that because now we have a way to generate neurons from any patient sample let's say from a skin biopsy or even a blood sample in the culture dish. And we can now then use these cells to study diseases that, that these patients have. Or we could make new cells that we could potentially use for a transplantation therapy. So I actually stole this picture here from, uh, from Bill, who kindly agreed that I can use it because it nicely illustrates what we know what's going on in Alzheimer's. As you have already heard, there are these plaques forming in these Alzheimer brains. Um, but turns out, or many people believe now, that these plaques actually are not so much the problem. What is though the big problem is that the neurons, which you show here, and down here is the sort of a healthy, how, how, how we envision healthy cells would look like. These neurons degenerate, they become sick and eventually die. And that is the main problem of Alzheimer's disease. And how these, these uh, cells are actually dying is not, is not well understood. So, so one idea was to try, like, once these neurons are gone, well, how about we try to replace them? So that's what got us first into this, um, into this arena, because we can make neurons in the culture dish from scratch, as I just uh, told you earlier. But um, in case of Alzheimer's, there's so many neurons dying, it, it will be really, really hard to try to regrow them in, in, in a way that makes sense because they not only need to be put in place, because all these neurons have to be also hooked up properly. So that is probably not happening in my lifetime that we will be able to, to, to do that, although we should keep working on it. But I just want to come back to this, um, to this um, idea here, sort of what is actually known why these neurons are actually getting sick. And it turns out that the brain not only contains neurons, it contains a lot of other cell types. And I found this amazing picture here, which illustrates this point. So this prominent cell here in the middle, again, is, is a neuron, but there's a lot of other cell types in the brain that um, are important for normal brain function. And as we know now, are also really important in brain diseases and including Alzheimer's disease. So uh, there are two, well, you see three additional cell types here, which we summarize as glial cell types. Glia is actually a Greek term and means glue. So it's, it's a little bit of a degrading term, I would say, because it suggests that they are just there to glue the neurons together, right? But it turns out that 
um, their function has been very much underappreciated and they're probably much more important than we have thought for a long time. So these glia cells come in three flavors. There are um, these microglia cells, which have been already been mentioned in, my, in the previous talks. Um, there are um, astrocytes that are um, depicted here in this, as this yellow cell, and there are oligodendrocytes. So I want to focus uh, now mostly on, on this microglia. Um, and the reason is because I told you about you know, our dream to sort of uh, transplant cells into the brain, potentially replace cells in the brain for a therapeutic um, benefit. So it turns out that these microglia cells are a little distinct in their um, lineage from the other cells. They are actually derived from a blood progenitor cell. And these microglia cells, you can call them also the immune cells of the brain. So it turns out when you do a, um, a bone marrow transplantation, and I apologize, the next few slides look a little scientific, so I'll try to walk you through them. So what we, what we have, uh, what, is, what the scientists and clinicians have noticed is when you do a bone marrow transplantation, for example, when you try to cure a leukemia, you do bone marrow transplantations, you replace the, the bone marrow with blood cells. But what happens is that also these microglia cells in the brain seem to be um, replaced, however, in a very, very um, inefficient way and only very few of them. So let me just walk you through these complicated uh, sort of diagrams here. So up here is just a timeline of an experiment that we actually did in the, in the, in the lab. Um, we um, do an injection here intravenously of uh, these bone marrow cells. So we re recapitulate the bone marrow transplantation as it is done in the clinic. And then we analyze these mice at, at various time points, two, four weeks, 12, and 24 weeks after the transplantation. And we first looked at the blood which is, of course, the main point of a bone marrow transplantation to be replaced. And as um, expected, it takes not very long, you know, just four weeks or so, until about a, almost 90, sometimes even 100% of the blood cells are all derived from the injected cells. And this is very stable over time, even up to 24 weeks, you still see that essentially the entire blood is derived from the injected cells. However, the situation is very different in the brain. So unlike in patients, of course, in mice, we can actually sacrifice the animals and dissect the brain and look how many cells got into the brain. And unlike uh, here on the left in the peripheral blood, the situation in the brain is very different. After four weeks, which is a time point where the, brain, the blood is already full of these donor cells, these transplanted cells, there is hardly any cells that made it already into the brain. It takes a much longer time, about three months or so, for some cells to show up, which you can see here. And you see these, these bars here, they, they, mean, they mean the variation here. So some animals have maybe just 10%, some have a, de a decent um, sort of chimerism in the brain, but overall it's very, very variable and low, and it takes a long time. So we were wondering, would, would it be cool if we could really um, sort of improve this, this incorporation of these cells into the brain? So we, we spent some time to work on this. And uh, what we found is the following really interesting phenomenon. We found that in a nutshell, you literally have to first make space uh, and get rid of the old microglia cells so that there is space for new cells to get into the brain. So we did a very simple experiment. We took a normal mouse, which is shown up here, a normal brain, and directly injected um, these bone marrow cells directly into the brain. So this is here a, a brain section. You see the hippocampus structure, which is where we, where we injected the, the cells. They were labeled with a green color. We call it green, green fluorescent protein, or GFP. And we see that the cells were actually surviving where we injected them, so the injection worked, but none of these cells express this marker, IBA1 or other markers, which are 
an indication that they have formed microglia cells. So they remain some, some other types of cells. However, when we first do a trick and use a brain that has no microglia and do the same experiment, inject the same cells in the same spot of the brain, now all of a sudden these green cells look very different uh, as you can appreciate, they are, sorry, the pictures are a little small, but they are little round dots here. And here you see some nice cells with sort of branches coming out of the cell bodies. And now almost all of these green cells also express this red label here, which is a marker of microglia. And this is here just an overlay of, the, of, the, of all the colors, just to illustrate the green plus, uh, plus red makes yellow, so we, we demonstrate here that these two labels are really co-expressed. So that was really exciting because it told us that in order to get microglia into the brain efficiently, you need to um, first essentially get rid of the... Yeah, you have to get out of the room. <laughs> I'm sorry, we have some homeschooling issues here. No problem. <laughs> At home. So that was an important lesson that the uh, endogenous cells need to be cleared out before the new cells can come in. So we then combined these two approaches. So now you are familiar already with this scheme here. We did a con conventional bone marrow presentation, but then added a drug, which has this complicated name, PLX5622, which um, essentially kills the endogenous microglia. And then we withdraw this drug again and, and provide normal food and then analyze the, uh, the brains again. And um, this is just the technique here, how we measure the cells. It's called flow cytometry, so that is not so important. The important uh, um, diagram is shown here. On the left side here, in this open circle, you, you see the control and the fraction of cells which um, um, are, have become microglia in, this, in these control conditions, which is, as I said, somewhat variable. Where, uh, however, in this treated group here, where we had treated the device after the bone marrow transplantation with this plexicon drug, now all of a sudden every mouse, so every, mo every dot here is a, is a different animal, shows a very reproducible, very high chimerism of these transplant cells. So this is just, you know, numbers. How do these cells actually look like? So as I said, in the case of a mouse, of course, we can open up the brains, make sections, and see how these cells look like. Again, we label these cells with this green color, with this GFP, and did sections and went through a microscope and, and looked at them. This is here the control situation. Um, this is actually the best spot in the brain that we could find. And you, de you do see some decent you know, numbers as the these uh, previous uh, sort of quantitative plots have, uh, have suggested, where we see these green cells sort of scattered around in the, in the brain, but most of the brain areas will look quite empty actually. In contrast though, when we do the sections of the animals that we had treated with this drug after the bone marrow transplantation, now you see how much more um, incorporation we have of these green cells. Um, and literally, all of these IBA1 positive cells, so all of this, the cells that look like microglia are actually now also green. So there is hardly any endogenous microglia left and pretty much all of the microglia have been now replaced with these green cells, with the injected cells. So this is just a tiny little um, you know, view, a tiny little fraction of the brain uh, we stitched a lot of pictures together from the micro microscope to see how does actually the whole brain look like. And this is an example of a whole mouse brain. If you look very carefully, you see these little squares here. So we took a lot of little pictures here and then stitched them together in Photoshop in the, in the, in the image uh, software. And uh, so it's a very low magnification and overview of the whole brain. And you have to be very, you have to look very carefully. Here's a little green dot, there's a couple, there's a bigger cluster actually, but most of the brain is pretty much empty of these, of these green cells. But this is the situation here in, in our modified, in our new protocol, 
where literally the entire brain is full of these transmitted cells. And that got us really, really excited because as many of you probably will know, it's even hard for a, for a, you know, a, um, a small molecule, a pill that you swallow to get into the, uh, into the brain because of the blood, blood brain barrier, as Dr. Lemke explained to you earlier, the blood brain barrier are um, essentially uh, you know, made up by these brain vessels and they are very, very tight. So very little can actually go and leave the bloodstream into the brain. So it's very hard to get anything into the brain. However, in this condition here, uh, we can get a lot of cells into the brain. So we have access to the entire brain. So being a, you know, a, a clinician thinking a lot of neurodegeneration, one of my first thoughts was how could we, could we somehow exploit the system for a potential uh, sort of treatment option? An important question to be first asked is, of course, these green cells, they, um, express this marker and they sort of look like microglia, but they're replacing the old microglia. Are they really exactly identical to them? And the answer is no. So when we look very carefully, here is um, just an image how normal microglia look like. Here in a sort of overview, you see a couple of these cells and here in a higher magnification of this little box here, you see those are beautiful cells with very long, fine branch processes. Well, this is here a situation 12 weeks after transplantation, how our cells look like, these cells that invade the brain after the bone marrow transplantation. Well, they look somewhat similar and they express the proper markers, as I said, but when you look at these, these fine processes, processes here, they are a little a little thicker, they're not as beautifully branched and fine. They're, they're little, sort of look a little clumsier. Um, when you wait a couple more weeks, then things look a little bit more similar, right? So these branches uh, are becoming finer and more, um, and the cells are a bit more spread out, but they still don't quite reach the same level of, of endogenous microglia. So we don't know at this point um, whether these small subtle differences matter um, and whether these cells have the full functional property of this microglia. It seems from, from these data and from some additional analysis that we have done is that these cells are a little bit more, we call it activated. So it seems that these cells have a little bit more um, of, of a reaction as if they will sense that something is going on in the brain. But whether this has a, a functional um, impact on, the, on these mice, that's something we don't know yet. Nevertheless, um, so that is sort of our dream. Now we know that we can replace literally all microglia with these, with these blood uh, uh, cells. And we actually now know, um, with data that I didn't have time to show you, that it is actually the blood stem cells themselves that are the most powerful of getting into the brain. So we can take a blood sample, uh, um, um, mobilized uh, uh, um, blood, so there's an, um, a clinical procedure where we can enrich for these blood stem cells. We can tape them, take them in, in culture. We, we could actually introduce, for example, a therapeutic gene that we think may have um, a beneficial role in these cells then do this transplantation pr procedure, and then all these microglia cells in the brain will be replaced with, with these cells where we can um, uh, have these cells release something that could sort of try to interfere with the, with the disease process and try to halt the progress of Alzheimer's disease. So just want to come back to this picture again. Um, so what is actually known about what makes these neurons sick and how could we potentially use these microglia cells as a, as a vehicle or as a, as, a, as a sort of foot in the door to try to stop this process? Well, it turns out that um, microglia and uh, uh, microglia in particular via astrocytes, as, as I will show you in, in a minute, um, have been implicated in exactly this uh, disease progression process. So it turns out that uh, there is a lot of genes 
and I hope I can, you can, can see this, and actually the details don't matter, so it's just a, a lot of gene names. Maybe I just want to highlight one of them, which is APOE, which you have heard a lot about already in the, in the previous talk, which turns out to be is highly expressed in these, in these microglia, but there's a lot of other genes that are um, mutated in Alzheimer's disease and confer a risk factor to develop the disease that are actually microglial genes. So these genetics speak a very clear uh, language. They, they tell us that somehow microglia must be involved in the disease process. And one line of thinking is that perhaps what is going on is that these microglia secrete um, factors when they're activated, um, which are um, shown here, uh, uh, scientists call them cytokines, small little, um, small little molecules, uh, like proteins, uh, uh, protein little molecules, peptides, that, uh, can, that signal to other cells, including these so-called astrocytes. And um, the effect of, the, um, of, these, of, of these little cytokine um, hormones, so to say, on astrocytes is that they then in a second step um, block the support for neurons because astrocytes and neurons are living very close together and the, the uh, astrocytes main role is to really keep the neurons healthy. So when these microglia, the idea is now, when these microglia are um, secreting these um, sort of pro-activating factors, they, um, they make these astrocytes sick first and, will, and that will have a secondary effect that the astrocytes will not be able to do a good of a job to keep these neurons happy. And that may be one important pathway why these neurons eventually uh, becomes, uh, or, or become sick and then eventually actually die. Yeah, Dr. So, Wernick, I'm sorry to interrupt you. We're out yeah. of time, uh, so can you wrap up pretty soon? I, I'm, al I'm, almost, I'm almost done. Okay. Because, because this is exactly the um, sort of the, um, the crux here where we think we can interfere with the disease process. Because these cells, as I um, showed you, we, we can replace and we can now replace these cells with, with cells that have a changed way of uh, secreting these, these hormones here or even that they are not even able to, to, sec to secrete those, um, those, those factors. And we want to see whether this manipulation here actually benefits um, the state of, of the neurons. So I just illustrated with two more slides our, our aims, what, uh, what we exactly want to do with the, um, with the grant that we were so fortunate enough to, to receive. So we, ha we, are have, uh, we have two approaches. One is based on, again, of these iPS cells that were mentioned already before. We make in a human uh, artificial tissues. Some people also call it mini brains, as you've heard before. And we can also add these microglia into these mini brains. And the idea is to use normal microglia and microglia that secrete some of these factors that are supposedly to make, uh, and then we'll see whether, you, well, whether these factors are actually sufficient to make these neurons um, actually sick and whether we can interfere with this process. And the second um, idea is to use the mouse models that were, were already um, described in the previous talks and see whether we can now take our new protocol here, replace the endogenous um, microglia with cells that, oops, sorry, that secrete these factors that we, we uh, hypothesize would make the neurons sick eventually and see whether we can maybe engineer these cells to protect, this, uh, to protect the neurons from the, from the disease process. And um, this is just my thank you slide again. Uh, thank you so much for this uh, amazing opportunity. I want to just give a shout out to my amazing poster uh, um, under the name of Yohei Shibuya, who did all the work that I showed you and who will um, um, execute these experiments. Thank you so much.